bioregenerative life support system. And so what that in essence is referring to is using biological approaches for closed uh, life support systems in space. And this could involve plants, it could involve uh, recycling waste water and solid waste biologically. So one volume of the lunar greenhouse, that, that space, that volume, is has been theorized to support one astronaut on a daily basis with all of their oxygen, all of their fresh water, and half of their calories. Roughly a, a person's weight in hydroponic salts can keep one person uh, alive for with the greenhouse and the composter and these two other systems for a year. All we're doing is mimicking what the plant would expect to have if it was on Earth and make use of it for life support. The entire system of the lunar greenhouse does represent, in a small way, uh, the biological systems that are here on Earth. You can envision coming up with basic ideas, testing them out, building prototypes, maybe then testing them in relevant environments and then having a, a, an actual functioning system, maybe in space. It's not like everything has to proceed serially. There can be parallel efforts uh, going at any one time. And an example of that might be the, the current plant chamber at the, at the South Pole Station. It's using conventional technologies, things like sodium lamps, but with maybe uh, advanced water cooling techniques, uh, conventional hydroponic approaches. But it's being done in a, in a very uh, relevant environment, so it's isolated, you know, hostile external environment. So that's, that's an important step along the technology readiness level. But that might not be exactly what you envision, say, for a lunar greenhouse. And so a parallel uh, technology development might be an inflatable, deployable structure. And then when you get to your final destination, you could expand them out or inflate them or deploy them as needed. Like uh, the lunar greenhouse effort at the University of Arizona. So there are two basic cycles that we're looking at in the lunar greenhouse, our water cycle and our atmospheric cycle. You start with the, the astronauts, uh, put out carbon dioxide, you introduce it into the greenhouse and the plants convert it to oxygen. The water cycle begins with fresh water that we either bring with us or discover where we are. From there that water is then oxygenated and given nutrient salts. That water is then continuously flowing across the root zone of the plants and returned to the system. We can run it in the makeup water for the plants, which transpire it into the atmosphere of the greenhouse, and then we condense that atmosphere and we get clean water. The crew uses this water for hygiene water, for drinking and other purposes, and then uh, this water, this wastewater, uh, is, is uh, generated, which goes into the composter, and you harvest this uh, um, gray water from the composter's atmosphere, and hopefully it'll be clean enough that we can run it in the makeup water for the plants. As far as water, we are easily um, produce enough water every day to, uh, for one astronaut and more. Oxygen, we're not even halfway we need to jam more plants in there or make them grow faster and produce more oxygen. One of the approaches that's been around for a number of years now is called the Himawari system. And this uses Fresnel lenses that uh, track, you can put it on a tracking drive and it will then track the sun and collect and concentrate the light so you can deliver it to the plants. The lunar greenhouse, I'm responsible for uh, the solar concentrator power system. Um, our approach aims at uh, integrating uh, uh, the, the power of harnessing solar radiation and splitting the spectrum in a two portion and uh, use it as much as possible for free. The idea of having this device tracking the sun and, and putting light into a fiber optic cable 
was an American idea. NASA's interested in it because not only can you get the, the visible light, but you can collect the, the non-visible light, the UV and the, the red and far red, and you can use that too, so you can harness the whole spectrum. This is where all the light from the Himawari comes in. And as you can see, each one of these is transmitting um, the sunlight that each of the lenses collects. Ideally, you would have two curves, one for the inside PAR and one for the outside PAR. RENSYS is, uh, uh, is the Remote Expert Network Decision Support System. Uh, basically, it's the brain of the uh, Lunar Greenhouse uh, uh, prototype. South Pole, this is Michael. Hey, Mike. How are you today? How's the weather down there? Well, it's wind chill brings it down to negative 72.1 degrees Celsius. Lane Patterson has gone down. He was our student through the construction of it, and, and you know, he's done his thesis on, on the South Pole uh, greenhouse. So, Lane, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go through uh, what it would be like if we're calling you uh, from the moon and you are on Earth. Okay, Mike, this is South Pole calling you at the moon. I'm looking at the lunar greenhouse situation report and I'm seeing that our oxygen production is a little low. How are you guys breathing up there? It's a little tricky. Using the RENSYS platform, our operator connecting from South Pole Station was able to access the real-time data and be able to uh, monitor the key variables and all those resource balances and also the alarms generated uh, from the lunar greenhouse system and he was able to provide directions or uh, suggestions for uh, better management of the lunar greenhouse system. Uh, in the background, this system actually combines a lot of models uh, to be able to monitor and analyze the data. During the project phase, uh, we were able to uh, train the models that we were using uh, for this particular system. Uh, however, it can be suited for other systems. And our international collaborators are helping us with that. Pronto Giorgio, si sono Roberto. It's important the relationship that we have with Alenia uh, Space, tells Alenia. We also have another company that is extremely important for us, AeroSecur. European companies like uh, Talis Alenia and AeroSecur are, are companies that have demonstrated capabilities of being able to do this and, and they're very uh, likely and logical partners to team with to build the final uh, equipment before you send it off on a space mission. Our outreach program, our activities of getting the information from this closed-in laboratory out into the real world, we do it in many ways as possible. But one of the big ways is that when people come to visit, I put the students in front. We want them there. They can talk more eye to eye to many of the students and even the generation of people that have not grown up with this like many of us have. The next big step, particularly in phase three, is to utilize additional lunar greenhouse units to do some specialized testing. As we develop the computer models to simulate what we're doing and to automatically control the environment, and provide that, I'll just say, constant level of oxygen that we want to have. And so I think it's, it's an interesting thing to consider that we're taking uh, our, our sort of terrestrial companions with us because we need them. We're, we're intricately dependent on them. Uh, there may be ways you could get around it in terms of engineering and stowage and resupply, but I think it, it wouldn't be a sustainable autonomous approach that uh, maybe in the future we, we all envision.